Thank you for inviting me here today to talk. Uh, I'm very excited to be in Taiwan and uh, get to know you chaps at Galaxy Zoo. Uh, I'm going to talk today about uh, the work I've been doing, as I said, at lunch for the last uh, of years as a bit of a side project of my PhD, which is becoming more and more of a main project as I go on, because uh, it's fun. Uh, it's, it's crowdsourcing, uh, but in a slightly different mode. Uh, the work I'm going to talk about today yeah, could not have been done without Tom Kitching. Uh, he, uh, is slash was my supervisor now at UCL, and uh, some later work that I did with going to do with Chris and Carl Willett, I'm sure. You want to know, so, um, so I thought I'd show you this 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 image here, which uh, is from the re recent uh, Sochi uh, Olympic Games. And I'm not sure if you saw this event, but this was the uh, the uh, cross ski, uh, which is this crazy event where they'll fly down this 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 uh, like a uh, course where you jump and you can move around. It's like uh, there's four guys, and there's only three of them in this picture because one guy's off, but we won. And this is actually from the final. And as they came over this last this last jump, they all stacked it and fell over. And basically, uh, the silver and bronze was decided on who basically crossed the line, the body body part crossed the line first. And uh, the reason I'm showing you this is because it's an example of how uh, competition and the will to win can really drive you to excel. Uh, and you can see here, this guy here really wants it, because even though he's in a state of trouble, he manages to reach his arm out. And this guy here manages to stick his arm out. This is actually an arm. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> so they're going left to right. They're going from left to right. So they've, just, they've just gone through the line. They've come over this hill from this side, and come over uh, this side, and come over down here. So um, it's a great image of how competition can really drive you to, 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 to do your best, even in, in, in adversity and when you think you're You've got no chance. Um, and in a similar vein, uh, I thought I'd point towards this quote that I found by Albert Einstein, which is, I think, quite a depressing quote to some extent. Uh, but um, nevertheless, highlights uh, a point. It's highlighting a point. Uh, so don't take it too literally, because uh, I know a lot of the work here is based on public of, of, of what people want to do. Um, but egos and competition are stronger forces than public uh, spirit and sense of duty. I.e., we all want to win at the end of the day, <laughs> which uh, I said take very lightly, but um, I thought it. So um, uh, going back to start, um, why we're all here is because uh, we want to use uh, public to help us achieve uh, cutting edge science uh, and to also use it as a source of uh, outreach as well. So we can explain ways of astronomy as well as doing good science at the same time. And uh, I'm sure if I asked you here today to, to classify these two galaxies, I'm sure I think most of you could probably do it, you know, and uh, it would be easy if it was an elliptical spiral, and if I asked you how many arms there were and whether they were rotating clockwise or anticlockwise and they had a bar, then you'd all do fine. Uh, if I asked you to do this many, I'm sure, again, you could, or each of you have a good go, uh, and if I did a thousands of, a thousand of those, I'm sure this week we could all sit down and probably do it together. 100,000, I'm sure this week we could write a website, perhaps, that got the public to do this for us. Um, however, if we had a 10 million a night, which I know uh, Chris uh, alluded to earlier, uh, which is what we're expecting objects from NSST, uh, this might become slightly difficult to ask human classification to do such a thing. I would, so, I, it is technically 10 million objects a night, but you know a lot of them are pointless. Yes, yes, I know. Okay. I'm using it as a, as, a, as a motivation for my talk, but yes, it's uh, yeah, likely. It's a pet peeve, I hear it a lot. Okay, well, yeah, it's, it's 10 million objects tonight, you're right, you're completely right. It's, it's, not, 10 million, 10 million things, it's not 10 million galaxies, no, it's not, no, you're completely right. Um, Sorry. That's okay, no, it's my, I, I was thinking that might happen, but I just, I don't know what... Anyway, I, I, I don't know, <laughs> anyway, I don't know the exact numbers for galaxies, but I knew that that was the number I, 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 I heard a lot at the LCD conference in, in, in Cambridge. Anyway, so... There are two, two challenges uh, that I personally feel are faced by human classification. Uh, first are the advent of, of new, new surveys that can bring in sizes of data sets we've never seen before, not just in astronomy, but in the whole of data science itself. These are things that, you know, we're going to produce, SK is going to produce in one night more information than there is on the internet right now. You know, uh, it's not just a problem that we're facing, it's, it's, it's never been seen before in the whole of data science. Um, and this bottom part here is, um, also, trying to show how um, we're requiring algorithms that are going to be the, the, the accuracy of algorithms that we require is also never been seen. So this part here is from a uh, Euclid requirements uh, paper, and it's showing you 
what the current best shear measurement, so how the current best algorithm that can measure the shape of a galaxy at the moment is, and that's uh, the, the, the blue is space-based and the, the, for space-based uh, mission, and the, the green is for ground-based. And you can just see this little dot line here, which is the Euclid requirement, and it shows you up to an I-band I magnitude of about 26, so we can be doing okay, but anything uh, that's dimmer than that, fainter than that, we're not doing okay. And we really need to be able to create algorithms that can measure the shapes of galaxies to, to extremely faint accuracy. So what I'm proposing in my talk is to be able to maintain this human element, but use it in a slightly different mode than we've seen typically and previously. Um, so there, so what I'm proposing, as you can probably guess, is some way of using competition as a way to develop new algorithms and new methods. And now this has been seen before in not only astronomy, but in science. Uh, so I've got a couple of examples here. Polymath was um, one of the very uh, original crowdsourcing um, ways of developing new ideas, uh, which was uh, actually a blog by a chap named Galda. And he basically had this uh, problem. There was this, uh, it was a Hewlett, something or other, I don't know the details of it. It's quite a complicated theorem, mathematical theorem, but no one had proven it yet. And he, he set up this blog, and people started contributing to this blog. And basically, over time, people were talking about it. And then ultimately, after a while, I think it was about a year, some chap came out and said, oh, I found the theorem via this blog and published it as a paper. And it was the first example from in maths of uh, crowdsourcing and this contribution of knowledge from various parties contributed and made this, uh, made this work. Uh, and then more recently, in, uh, in, in gravitational lensing, we've had a slightly more organized, shall I say, uh, competitions. Uh, this is the most recent, which is grade three, which is the gravitational lensing accuracy test challenge. This started off in 2008 with the STEP challenges, which is the sheer testing program. And basically, it's just giving people within astronomy, mostly, images of galaxies, ask them to develop algorithms, and then provide answers to a common test set, and then they got, and then they got reported back how well they were doing. Um, very, very successful, but somewhat insular to the lensing community. Um, so very, very useful, but also you know the, the scope wasn't particularly large. And then even on the opposite side, the scope very large for the Google X Prize, which I'm sure you've heard about, which is this uh, sort of like um, work basically there um, saying that you know first person to put a probe on a, a rover on the moon will win a million pounds. So it's a different type of competition. Uh, some of them are very sort of just for scientific development. Some of them are trying to with an end goal with more more competition, and some are purely competition with some big monetary prizes at the end of it. Um, so there are now set up. This has obviously been proven to be a re not proven, but it's been, it's, it seems like a very useful way of developing algorithms, not only for science but for all sorts of things. And they're now becoming websites, uh, companies that are setting up these kind of things. Uh, so there's a company called uh, Innocentive, which is one company which is um, an open platform to try and develop new ideas to solve problems. Uh, and they work with people like Nature and Global Health. Uh, and another couple of uh, companies, which are Kaggle and Popcode, are much more data science driven companies who are looking to develop algorithms uh, for a variety of companies. Um, Here's just, a, here's just a few of them. So um, they've worked with universities. Harvard, for example, uh, did a. They both, Harvard have both worked with Top Coder and Kaggle. Uh, some charities, uh, NASA have worked with both. And then also commercial companies, uh, insurance companies who want to maybe predict uh, better whether someone's going to default on a loan. Or sorry, uh, who's going to claim on their insurance, should I say, or banks, whether they're going to default on their loan. So there's all sorts of avenues of why these companies are investing in this kind of com competition uh, co-development um, because it's driving people to excel in those areas and develop new algorithms that are achieving better results than anything they have from built in within their departments. So um, I went to Kaggle uh, with the hope to tap into this new method and this new development uh, and actually run uh, astronomy competitions because I thought it would be a brilliant way to, uh, just like Galaxy Zoo, solve your own internal problems with wanting to do science and also doing some outreach at the same time. So I went to Kaggle, uh, which is um, 
as I said, it's a startup company in San Francisco who who put on these competitions online, give the users of over 100,000 people now, I think it's 150,000 users on their website, data sets, and then these people can download those data sets, develop prediction algorithms or image analysis algorithms or whatever, upload their answers, they get tested, then over a certain amount of time, this competition will, will go over and you can keep improving this model until the winner will get a prize, person, the company or the research group gets an algorithm and Kaggle will get some kind of cut or whatever you agree with them. So um, I went to Kaggle uh, and uh, I thought uh, a, a quick overview of the kind of competitions that Kaggle actually do uh, would be quite good uh, because although they're a commercial company, they um, they do a lot of research as well, which I want to highlight. They're not just the devil, just up as, a, as, as an angel. Uh, so uh, they do have featured competitions, which you can pay a lot of money um, and then be at the top and be very heavily pushed by Kaggle. So that can be research. A lot of researchers do have that because they do a lot of bio bioinformatics and genetics and pharmaceutical research, which can often be run by private entities. Um, so often there's a lot of money in that. Um, there's master's competitions, which are purely private. So in Kaggle, you have, um, as you compete in more competitions, you get Kaggle points. So if you finish top of a, a competition, you'll get a certain number of points. And therefore, over time, you'll see who are the best people in these competitions. So if you pay a lot of money, you can get the top 10, say, uh, people on this website, and you'll get all the algorithms within that competition. And no one can, no, it's not publicly available, basically. No one can enter only those 10. Uh, there's recruitment competitions, which is basically um, you start a competition and it's sponsored by a company, and that, at the end of that time, the company can interview and get the CVs of anyone who entered. So it's like a recruitment way, so you can filter out people that way, um, which is basically how my competition got funded in the end. And then the, the largest block here is actually the research competitions. So as I said, this can range from uh, bioinformatics uh, companies uh, all the way through to uh, universities. So here's one from Imperial here, and you can see very small sort of Galaxy Zoo here from our, our competition we're running. Uh, and there's all sorts of things. Uh, the Brown are just the fun competitions where maybe a research company doesn't have any money and they can't afford to put up a, up a, a prize, but it's an interesting act anyway. So Kaggle always, need, always want this to be full. So they, they put these on, you can win like slightly stash, like clothes, Kaggle clothes, things like that, or just pride, and uh, you know you can get some Kaggle points. And at the bottom, you've got getting started for those people that don't know anything about data science and who want to get involved, and there's tutorials and things like that you can do. And I, I actually, in fact, wrote the Titanic one, which is the most successful one. So, <laughs> um, so yeah, um, so, um, so I said um, I went to Kaggle uh, a couple of years ago, but in fact, my supervisor, Tom, did the initial code competition, which was mapping dark matter, and he basically gave participants um, images of galaxies and asked them to measure the shapes. Basically, what are the ellipses to your galaxies? So they gave them a ton of shapes to train on. So they gave them a load of load of galaxies um, that said, right, well, here's like you know um, high signal to noise real galaxies, uh, which we know, and then from simulations, and basically gave them a to train on, and they gave them a test on. Uh, and this is kind of the results. Um, you have to excuse the kind of strange uh, plots, but Tom did a really weird paper where he presented the uh, result, the old results, the published ones in this way, and the ones from the actual paper in this way. I don't even know why. Anyway, so on the right hand side here is the results from the shear testing program, which is the astronomy run one, the first, the second one, the second astronomy run one. So all these dots are. Uh, um, professional astronomers, uh, and this this box here is what's this box here, and these dots here are the the estimates from the Kaggle competition. So you can see they're within this box here, which is basically doing much better than any of the published results. And basically, what he found was was they found that he found a factor of ten improvement on methods tested on constant shear blind simulation. So if you added a little bit of shear or gravitational energy to every galaxy, then these competitors who only had two months to do this competition were doing better than any previously published result. And they had a factor of three improvement on action high signal noise galaxies. So you can see it was a, it was a huge success uh, as a first competition. 
So when I went there, I went with the idea, this is going to be really good. I'm going to go there, do my own competition. I'm going to solve my PhD. And I can sit back and let them do it for me. So what I did uh, is um, I went to there, and I said, right, I'm going to give, I have an idea where I would do dark matter reconstruction. So I'm going to play a little game here. We all love games to so break up the boredom. So uh, in here is a dark matter halo. Uh, I don't know if everyone knows about lensing here, but uh, I'll give you a guess where you might think it might be. In this, each tick mark is a galaxy, I should say. Uh, and this is representing the Hubble field of view, so about 4,000 pixels each way. Uh, and I'm sure you can all guess that I thought I'd play around with. Uh, <laughs> he's there. Uh, and if you do anything about lensing, you can see these giant arc, these like tangential arcs around the center of the table. Uh, it's pretty clear. So in this one, um, there's three halos in this one. I'm going to give you that now. And I'm, before anyone says it, obviously it's there. Uh, but anyone wants to hazard a guess where the other two are? Two thousand one hundred, two thousand eight hundred. Two thousand one hundred, two thousand eight hundred. Okay. Yeah. yeah. There. Anyone else got to hazard a guess? I'm not going to hazard a guess. Why not? <laughs> <laughs> Come on, <Phil. laughs> I spent too much time. Two thousand one hundred three on the y-axis, three thousand five hundred on the x-axis. Yeah. Yeah, something in there. Lower down than that. Yeah. Yeah, so that's that. Okay. Okay, well, keep in mind what you're thinking and uh, let my little stars fly. <laughs> <laughs> so if you got near those, well done, because it's not clear that these are going to be there. And it, it shows you this, this 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 problem can't be solved by eye. It needs it needs to be done with 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 a with an algorithm. And you need to be able to fit or somehow convert these galaxy shears into dark matter and to mass destroy. Put it up on that. They're very small uh, halos. Uh, oh, so yeah. these are this one is massive, but this one these are like ten to the thirteen solar masses, which imprints the signal noise is less than one, I think. So, uh, so yeah. So what I did was I, I basically said, right, I'm going to give you 360 of these fields, similar fields of galaxies. For those 360, uh, I'm going to tell you where each halo is in the field. Um, for 120 of them, there were one one halo. For 120, there was two halos, and 120 there was three halos. And I told you, yeah, I told you the positions. And then I gave you 120 to be tested on. So you would uh, download all these lot, you'd train on this, and then you'd try and upload, and you'd be tested on this. In this test set, I would tell you how many halos were in the field, because the main reason I did that was because trying to determine a metric. When you didn't get the right number of halos, was just far too difficult. So we thought we would just say, look, you know, there's three halos in here. Where are they? And you can imagine that in real data because you might have some gas, you might have some extra information or something like that to help you out. Um, a bit on uh, a bit on the way Kaggle works. Um, you have something called a public leaderboard and a private leaderboard. This is to avoid overfitting. Basically, you don't want people to download your data, upload your score, upload their guesses their, to the test set get their score back, tweak their model, reload the score again, get a slightly better score, tweak it a bit more, upload it a bit more, tweak it, and then you know, just basically inch your way towards the, uh, which, is, which is not useful for us, because we're not going to be using, we're going to be using this data, these, these algorithms, on things where we don't know the ground truth. So what they do at Kaggle is, in that 120 uh, cluster test set I told you about, you would split it into public tester and a private tester. On the public, you, when you upload, you, and you don't know which are which, so they're just randomly distributed without, throughout the test set. And you upload your results, and you see the score you get, you see during the competition, is the score only based on this, on this public test set. When the competition ends, it will be revealed your private score, which is based on the other 90. So it means that even if you tweak your parameters loads, you might get an amazing score on this, but because it's test blind tested on this, you might get a terrible score on this. So it's in your own best interest to keep your your code or your, your algorithm as, as general as possible. Um, this is just to prevent people from cheating and tweaking. They also only allow you to submit two uh, submissions a day. So you can't just submit like, you can't tell the bot and keep doing the math um, and it turns out that these are rather small, and for machine learning for, for the standard machine learning uh, competitions, these are an order of tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands. Okay, crikey. Um, 
Oh, crikey, I didn't realize that one. <laughs> okay, so um, the, the metric in these things is very important. Uh, and you've got to make sure that um, you're solving, your metric is designed, basically, because obviously you've got to score people, and it's got to be made sure that whatever you're producing, whatever your metric is, is rewarding what you want to be rewarding your algorithm and penalizing what you don't want your algorithm. So, 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 for example, in ours, we had two starts where F was how close are you away from the, uh, the halo, and the, and the other half, G, which was uh, basically, are you angrily invariant to the estimate? Are you, are you not systematically biased in any direction, such that if you keep doing this over and over, you won't get any bias in your algorithm? So it's really important whenever you're doing competitions, you do this. Um, so based on white competition, we found that we had, oh, the top one had to so we had 350 participants compete, and of the top 150, they all did better than Lens Tool, which is a publicly available code. Uh, and the top three uh, competitors did. Uh, so this is um, this is the top three here, and this chap in the blue, Tim Tannemans, did incredibly well compared to the yellow, which is the the, in the, the sort of state of the art, should we say? And most of the most of the algorithms we found were mostly Bayesian fitting. Some did machine learning techniques, like, um, but the feature extraction in machine learning was very difficult in these in these cases. So the most of them were just Bayesian fitting models and sampling cleverly in the parameter space for x, y, masses, and all those things. So I should quickly, before we go and touch on uh, the competitions currently running, um, I was going to ask you to, to determine the, 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 spot the link between the four of those images, but uh, they're all image analysis competitions that Kaggle's run. Mm -hmm. uh, and basically what I've done uh, is, with Galaxy Zoo, we've taken the Galaxy Zoo 2 data set, and we split it up into test set and private test set, uh, sorry, test set and training set, set and we've basically given the um, competitors, basically we've asked them to classify the probabilities, uh, classify the galaxies by returning the probabilities of each galaxy being a certain classification. So it's based on the decision tree, the galaxy decision tree. So we want them to return, basically, if you've got a galaxy, what, what's the probability of being a spiral, um, say an elliptical, that's a cigar-shaped elliptical. Um, and then the probabilities are weighted so such that because it's a bit complicated as a decision tree, as you get further down, so if uh, you have to wait by the number of uh, votes in the previous tree. So for example, if, um, so you've got, you've got your, got your property for one galaxy, and let's say 90% of the people that voted for it said it was a, uh, an elliptical, then of those ellipticals, let's say 10% said it was a cigar, the probability of being a cigar would be then 0.1 times 0.9, uh, and so on down through the attrition tree. So each one's weighted by the number by the previous probability, uh, and we ask them to return those, and then you've got a, an RMSE of that of that probability. So I don't think you see as well. This is the current score we've got at the moment. So this is showing this is 0.07 RMSE at the moment on the galaxy. So that's telling us that the top person at the moment is getting it right roughly 92% of the time of the probabilities using the Galaxy Zoo classifications as the ground truth. So that's the important point here, using the Galaxy Zoo classifications as the ground truth, um, which is obviously up for much debate whether that's... We had a big debate of whether do we want people to return what the public think or like what, is, what do we want out of the competition. That was basically what we decided to do. So there's lots of things here which I would talk about about running a competition, but if you do want to run your competition, I would advise just like this will be online, and you can talk to me a lot about this because there's a lot of stress and there's a lot of things you have to be careful about when you're running these kind of competitions, which I learned a lot and through the very hard way, uh, the very short way. Um, so just quickly touch on the future of this. Um, I think um, obviously this funding funding is one of the most important key things. It's uh, we've been very lucky to have Winton Hedge Fund who are very much investing in. Uh, astronomy and postdocs to, to fund us. Um, I said for my competition it was the recruitment, so they got to to hire the best ones and through the winter for the Cattle Zoo, the Galaxy Zoo one, sorry, they were just like have sixteen thousand dollars off you go. They were very nice and they said we'll just do it for the publicity. Um, so they, they said well, we do we didn't even need our name on it. So they were really nice about that. The caveats of this are you've already be careful about developing it, the winning code, because it's very difficult to because these people are doing it part time. So to get them to actually develop it through to, to real data is extremely difficult. So best bet, you need to, to collaborate with them. Um, 
And in my mind, what this will do is obviously people are thinking, oh, we don't want to replace this because this is going to replace Galaxy Zoo. But with this future, I see what would happen is, is you take LSST or something like that, you classify a small percentage of them, and then any algorithm developed by this way, you could then train with small, run it on the rest of the LSST uh, sample. Bob Schoenke, you've got fantastic science out of uh, your 10 million objects tonight. Uh, <laughs> so uh, uh, basically, just to just to drive home what I'm saying, competitions are a great way to to develop algorithms and and really improve, make fast improvements quickly. Um, uh, however, there are caveats. It is dependent on your on your simulations. It depends on what you provide with them. What do you want out of them? What do you want to test? And I'm not saying it's the be all end all, but it's a very good way of of learning algorithms, and it should be. Good for the future. Uh, I'm just going to self-publicize a bit. We have, this week, in fact, Nature did an article on crowdsourcing. I don't know if you see this. It's in the magazine and online. And it's about polymath and the Kaggle competition and Galaxy Zoo. I mentioned in this. In this so have a look at that. And this is my paper that I wrote on this, on this competition. So have a read. If you like so thank you very much. Thank you. So we don't know what that algorithm does at the moment because it's currently in literally basically he at the end of it we'll know what he's doing um, and we'll be able to talk to him and he has to provide us with loads of documentation, really serious documentation. But um, as I was talking to Chris earlier, the people that discuss that algorithms are normally mid table because they're not going to win, they just want to improve and get better, whereas the people at the top normally are very quiet and just get on with it. So we won't know what they're, they're doing until the end, unfortunately. Which is the Oh, of course, yes. And uh, we were saying as well, because you can actually download all the submissions. You can actually see wh whether the top 10 people, are they all failing on the same galaxies, or is it random and things like that. So you can do a lot of analysis from it. Uh, but it's interesting you pointed out that Kaggle is doing research into how these competitions work. Are they looking into organizing a collaborative approach to innovation as well as a competitive one? Do you mean, what do you as a community mean? Well, it's interesting that with the chemical competitions, everybody develops independently and, and in secret in an attempt to win the full prize. Yeah. Itself. But it might be interesting to compare that with a collaborative approach where people come together, like in Polymath, yeah. to solve the same problem fully independently. So you can join up teams in this. So you can, if you're, if you're playing in it and you can collaborate and you want to work with someone else, you can be like, let's join up in a team. and university, whole groups can join up. And a lot of the time what happens is you get groups of master students come together and work on them. So there is the opportunity to work on teams and come together. I think um, Kaggle themselves won't provide any kind of like non-competitive basis set. Because for them, I think that's like part of their, their sort of like USP. But you do have the opportunity to work together as teams, which happens in the big competitions. In the very big competitions, companies submit teams. So in the ones where you can get one, one like $3 million, um, they submit, like entire entire companies submit that. We had one really awkward moment where one, com one, one competition, Microsoft had the top two winning teams and they had almost identical scores and what happened was, was Microsoft one team had given their code to another team and they both just won, so they both won the survey, so like, which is quite uh, interesting, but yeah. Uh, so you can see the... Other people's office politics. Yeah, so exactly. Good. All right, no, I think that's really interesting, so I look forward to, to doing more on that. We're going to move on, I think, at the time um, as we stagger over the finishing line of this first day of talks. Um, we're pulled across it by.